Hey everyone, Cody here, and today I want to address a question that I see asked a lot online, but also a, it's kind of a comment that I see on my own videos, and that comment is this, can anyone make a Jackson Pollock painting? Or you may have seen variants of this, you know, anyone can make a Jackson Pollock painting, or you know, my kid could make a Jackson Pollock page. But the reason I want to make this video is because I, I think it's really important. You see, Jackson Pollock, if you look at his work, it, it's very easy to see the type of work that he's done and say, oh, yeah, anyone could make that. And you could make work that is inspired by that. But ultimately, my answer is no. No one could make Jackson Pollock's work. You would only make work inspired by that. But... I want to talk about a few things to kind of support that argument. So let me go back a little bit. So that question, can anyone make a Jackson Pollock painting? You could make work that was similar, but you'll never be able to make that work. And I think that this is true with any work. You know, even if, uh, you know, if you wrote a book that was similar to another writer, or if you painted in the style of another painter, or if you directed films like another film director, or if you made music that was inspired by another artist, it will always have some part of your personality in it. Even if you tried to copy that person exactly in their style and their tempo, there will be parts of your personality or your character that bleeds into that work. So it will never be like that. Now, could you make similar work that is, you know, very similar or kind of almost copycat? Yes, you could. Yes, you could make similar works. But no one could make exactly what that artist made. Now, let's come back to Jackson Pollock specifically and talk about why I think that no, no one could make a Jackson Pollock painting because there's a lot of parts to this. So first, uh, there's three supporting, I guess, sections to this argument that I want to make, all right? And I call them the three M's or the M and M and M's or the M squared, whatever you want to call them, right? It's the materials he used, and then it's the method itself, and then it's the man himself. Okay, so materials, method, man. So let's just move right into it. So the first part of this is materials. So there's kind of three major materials um, in any painting, right? There's the surface in which you paint on, there is the material you use to paint with, and then there is the tools in which you use to create that artwork. So let's start with the surface. Now, Jackson Pollock painted paintings on canvas. That is not unusual. That's very, very, very common, right? That's what most paintings are made on. Now, some people use wood and some people use, you know, metal. Some people use, uh, you know, plexiglass. There's a lot of materials out there that people paint on, but Jackson Pollock painted on traditional canvas. Now, the thing that's a little different about Jackson Pollock's works is that many of them were on linen canvas. Now, if you know, if, if you're a new artist, you may not know the difference really between cotton canvas and linen canvas, um, but if you've been around for a while, you do understand that linen tends to be a lot more expensive. Now, I would argue it probably is higher quality um, because the weaves are generally either tighter or just the, the the material itself is very durable. Linen tends to be a very durable um, material. Now, I don't honestly know because I'm not a historian. I don't know the, the history on materials. <sighs> But back, you know, 70 plus years ago when Jackson Pollock was painting, he painted a lot of his works on linen canvas. Now, if you look at canvas nowadays, linen is actually pretty expensive to paint on, especially compared to cotton, which is what most canvases or at least most most available canvases are made out of this canvas. If you go to a can like a, a regular hobby store or even a craft store or an art store, most of that canvas that you're going to get is cotton. Now you can buy linen, you know, online or you can buy it from a an actual art supply store. Um, but generally linen is more expensive. So I don't know if back in the day maybe linen was a lot cheaper or if you know maybe it was a lot uh, more common or more available than cotton was and then cotton eventually just overtook it. I honestly don't know that history on materials. But Jackson Pollock's works were on linen. So that part of that 
you could probably still replicate. I mean, you could still buy, you know, unrolled canvas, uh, you know, rolls of unstretched canvas that is linen. And I know some professional artists that use linen canvas, and I just know it's very expensive. Okay. <laughs> so that part of it, you could probably replicate. Now, the means of how that linen canvas is made or how it's cut or, you know, things like that. Those things might have changed over the years. So maybe linen canvas now isn't as good or it's better than what it used to be. But let's just say for argument's sake, that part you could replicate very easily. Now, let's move into the substrate or what he used to create his paintings, which is the paint itself. This is a very, this is an interesting one. Okay, so if you look at the paint he used, Jackson Pollock used a type of paint called gloss enamel. This is the type of paint I use. In fact, it's right here. This is gloss enamel. Gloss enamel essentially is a glorified house paint. It is a very, very shiny house paint. And it's used for, you know, painting things like guardrails. Like the guardrails you would see like at a school or at a park where it's very vibrant, you know, and shiny. Or uh, fire hydrants. Things like that. Things that would be you know, would require the shine to kind of make them stand out, but they're also very durable. The paint is very durable. So Jackson Pollock used gloss enamel. But here's the thing. Paint has changed a lot over the last 70 to 80 years. And so the paint that Jackson Pollock used is not going to be like the paint that's used today. Now, I've heard some people say that the paint he used was oil-based. I've seen other people say that it was water-based. That part of it would change a lot because the way that you work with oil paints is different than the way that you work with water-based paints, or most people would call them acrylic. But my point out of that is, is that the paint that he used would not be like the paint that we use today because of standards, because of environmental standards, and because of regulations. So think about this just for a second. 40 plus years ago, Lead paint was common. That was a common thing. Even when I got my, I, I lived in a townhouse that was like 40 plus years old and I had to sign a waiver that I was okay with it having lead paint in it. So just that alone could have been in the paint that he was using. Now we don't, I, I honestly don't know what materials were in that type of paint. All I know is that the paint that he would have used would have been different than the paint that we use today. Now, the paint that I use is mostly water-based. I do know a few other gloss enamel artists that use oil paints, but I also know some that use water-based paint. That, that part of it is going to change a lot, right? Whether you use water or oil, because that affects what materials you can add, how you would, um, you know, how you would thin that out, how it would dry, things like that, right? But my point out of all of that is that what that just that little tweak of whether it be oil or water based is on top of the fact that those chemical structures of the paint itself is different. So why am I even bringing that up? Well, that means that how he would have created the paintings would still yield probably a very different result to the paintings that you could create today. So, however he made his paintings, you know, with his layering and his, you know, his methods and all that would be different than the way that you would make this painting now because of the difference in the paint. And the paint is a huge part of it. It's what makes the painting, obviously, because it's called painting. So, that's another part of it. You know, you wouldn't be able to simply replicate the paintings for the sheer fact that paint nowadays is not going to be like the paint that was used. 70 years ago, okay? So that is the second part of it. The third part is it is the tools. So the tools that Jackson Pollock used. Now, we know from pictures and from interviews and, you know, uh, short video clips of some of the tools that Pollock used. He used, uh, you know, like the glass basters where they, you know, it sucks it up and then he, he would squirt it out. We know that he used like injectors, kind of like that. Um, we know that he used the back of paintbrushes and sticks and, uh, you know, some other things, some, some hard surface uh, items like that. We know that he used items like that. But is that everything that he used? Who's to say, right? We don't know for sure all of the different types of tools that 
Jackson Pollock used to create his paintings. So that being said, even knowing some of the tools, we could probably replicate some of the 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 line work or some of the splashes or something like that. But ultimately, you know, we would know how he made every single stroke. Okay. Unless we were Jackson Pollock himself, and we'll get to that, we would know how he made every single stroke on every single painting. You know, it's possible that he switched between tools while he was making his paintings. I would assume that he probably did just looking at some of the splash work but I'm not a historian. I'm not an art historian. I'm not an expert on Jackson Pollock. Only I've only made paintings in that style and have used different tools to kind of get an idea of what that looks like. Okay. Now, one thing I want to say about the paint, going back a step, is dilution. Okay. What I mean by that is how much he diluted those paints, right? You can tell that he did dilute them because they were very thin. And a lot of the work that he did, you can see that it's kind of translucent or it, it, it spreads out. So if I dilute, if I don't dilute paint and I throw it on a canvas, just from personal experience, it just creates a line, right? It, it kind of like this, like you see in the background. This painting was with, and this is just a throw piece that I was messing around with, but you can see the solid line work. That's because that paint was not diluted. So when I threw it on the canvas, it didn't separate because there was no dilution. Now, Jackson Pollock diluted his paints, and you can tell in the splash work because the, the pieces are fractured, right? The lines are fractured. There's splash work, meaning it was diluted because when it hit the surface, it broke apart. Even if he threw it from a high angle or if he was elevated when he threw it down, if, the, if it was not diluted, much of that paint would have stayed together. So again, we don't know how, how much he diluted that paint to create those effects. Now we can kind of mess around with different things and, and probably get very similar, but we wouldn't know for sure because again, we're not him. So and that's another thing that, you know, we don't know. So we could create something similar, sure. And maybe with trial and error, we would, there's a watch going on. So we don't actually know, you know, the dilution that he used for his paintings. So now let's go back to the tools. That changes how the tools would interact with that paint. So you've got, you know, we know some of the tools, we know the type of paint, and we know even the type of material that he painted on. But even knowing all of that, you would still only come somewhat close to be able to create something like that. Because moving into the second part of this argument, the method, all right? So obviously, one thing that Pollock did that most artists do not do is he painted down, right? He laid the canvas out on the floor and he painted on the canvas itself, unstretched, to create his paintings. This was not a common practice and it still isn't for most artists. But that method of being of throwing the paint on it was what he developed. Now, I have a theory on how this kind of came about because if you look at paint, gloss enamel, having used it myself, is actually a cheaper alternative to painting than actual artist paint. It, let me give you an example. Paint like this, gloss enamel, a quart, so 32 ounces, right? I believe. Oh, it's pint? I don't know. I thought it was a quart. Quart of paint for me here in the US and Arizona is about $16 for a quart of paint, and that's without discounts or anything. So, a quart of paint is about $16. Keep that in mind. Now, if I use uh, regular artist paint, I'm going to grab one. Something like this, which is four ounces, 
uh, roughly comes out to about five or six dollars. Maybe on sale it's like four. Okay, so let's go with the low end price of four. Okay, now this quart is roughly 32 ounces, right? So it's quite a bit, you know, it's four cups. Well, this is only four ounces. So if at $4 for four ounces, I would have to buy, what, eight of these, right, to come out to that 32. So eight times four is $32. So just going on the low end price, this would be $32 to match the amount of paint that is in that quart of paint. Now, that's assuming that I'm buying cheap acrylic paint and that there is no discount on the uh, gloss enamel. My point being out of that is that, let's say for, for clean numbers, that for half the price, I'm getting the same coverage, okay? Now, Something to consider is that not only that, but this gloss enamel is very easily diluted because it's almost basically house paint. So you can add a little bit of water or thinner if it's oil based and thin that out. And you would you would not really notice the difference in the in how well it covered, but you would get more volume out of it. Acrylic. Sometimes if it's not a very high end acrylic, which is very expensive, it starts to separate and you lose some of that, you know, that brightness and you, you lose some of that, that shininess and the coverage because it thins out. So if you, you have kind of two options there, you just use that thinner coat or you have to buy more expensive acrylic paint so that when you thin it out, you don't really notice it as much because the binders that are in cheaper quality paint. So let's say that you did use high quality paint. Well, that's going to be even double the price at least. So really what you're paying is $64 for the same coverage as that $16 can of gloss enamel. The point I'm trying to make out of all this is that I think, I don't know why Pollock exactly was using gloss enamel at that time. I don't know if he was just testing it out or, you know, if it was an accident that he created it. I know that in the movie he had the can and he dripped it on the canvas and then he ended up making the painting. And maybe that's exactly how it went. Maybe it's nothing like it. But what I do know from painting with gloss enamel myself is that for the money, gloss enamel goes pretty far especially compared to acrylic paint. You see, if I buy a $16 can of paint, I know that compared to at least double the price, but probably more, I'm going to get the same coverage for a painting. So for the price, it actually makes sense. So let's come back to the method itself. The method itself would not have been born if he wasn't using gloss enamel. So not knowing why he was using gloss enamel, maybe just for the sheer sake of saving money and trying something new, he was using gloss enamel and that forced him to paint on the ground. Listen, I've done gloss enamel paintings for a couple of years now. It is very difficult to paint a gloss enamel painting while it's standing straight up because the paint wants to drip down. So you almost are forced to paint on the ground. Now, you could do all that, right? You could put a canvas on the ground and you could splash gloss enamel on it. That part, I'm not arguing. Anyone could do that. But what we don't, couldn't, you know, replicate, what we don't know for sure is the exact brush strokes and the movements that he used to create every single line. If you look at Pollock's work, there's a lot of different types of movements, and I think he tested different things out in his paintings. That's why they're not always 100% consistent. But if you look at his works, there's a lot of different types of lines. There's curves, and there's broken slashes, and you know, there's arcs. All of these different things have to be made using different movements, but also those tools we mentioned earlier. So just looking at a Jackson Pollock, 
it's impossible to tell exactly what movements he made with what tools. This is important because yes, you could use whatever tool you wanted to make a Jackson Pollock inspired painting, but that doesn't mean you're gonna match the movements he made because Jackson Pollock, after making a couple of these, would have had an idea of how to make the different brush strokes or the different line works with the different tools he was using. The whole point out of all of this is that even looking at a Jackson Pollock, you would not be able to tell how he made every single line with what tool, how diluted the paint was, and what movement he used. Now, you could guess and you could make similar works because you could use the tools that he used and you could use gloss enamel by today's standards and you could mess around doing different things to kind of get an idea of those brushworks or the lines or whatever you want to call them. This is what I've done in the paintings that I've made that were Pollock inspired but again it will never be Pollock's because I don't know how he made every single line on every single painting, and I don't know exactly in what order he did every line as well. You see, this comes down to a lot of different things. Another thing that I think over gets overlooked is the environment in which Pollock painted. See, Pollock painted in New York mostly, and being in New York, it's much different there than, say, here in Arizona. You see, our mild days tend to be hot days in New York. But our hot is something that New York will probably never see because, you know, it reaches 120 here. But see, in New York, it also gets super cold. And their cold is snow, which we hardly ever see, at least here in Phoenix or close to where I live. So my point out of that is that when you paint, that drastically affects how you would paint, especially if you're painting outside. Now, if you watch the Pollock movie, he's painting outside in a, in a shed or a barn or whatever you want to call it, right? What that means is that those paintings were subjected to the elements of living in New York where it's going to be cold during the winter. So if he painted his paintings during the winter, it's going to be super cold. And it seems like in the movie that he is painting when it's cold. Now, I don't, I've never lived in New York or even been there, so I couldn't tell you how it is in the summer or anything. I would assume it's, it's a lot more reasonable. But my point out of that is that that would affect how he painted. That would affect the layering. That would affect um, how diluted the paints were. It would affect you know, different things on how that painting was created. So why am I bringing that up? Well, it would affect how that painting turned out. And if you, as the viewer, as a normal person, were to paint like Jackson Pollock and try to create your own, the effect you get is going to be different than what he got or even what I would get. Because I've talked about this in other videos. If you watch my videos about creating abstract art in Arizona, the biggest challenge for me is the heat. It is the heat hands down because the heat causes my paintings to dry super rapidly. Now, I've kind of learned how to work with that. So it's usually not a big deal depending on the type of painting I'm making or, you know, depending on what I'm trying to do, especially with Pollock style paintings where I've done them as commissions or for YouTube, those paintings tend to dry very quickly, which can be great for me because I can layer those paints on top of each other real fast. They will dry and then I can move on to the next layer. But in New York, if it was freezing cold, and he was painting, and those layers were not drying, that would affect how he layered them. You see, if you, in having done gloss enamel paintings, especially the Pollock style, what I've learned is that if you layer the layers on top of each other too soon, they bleed together. Those layers will actually pool together and create one color. So say I did a layer of white and then a layer of black on top of that, but I didn't wait for them to dry, those kind of pull together and compress and, and, and they, they spread out and become a pool of colors as opposed to distinct lines. So 
Again, that is another factor that Pollock would have had to have considered when making those paintings. And if you just any other person were to make those paintings, but you didn't let those layers dry, you're going to get a different effect than what Pollock got when he made those paintings. Again, that would also have to do with the dilution of how diluted those paintings were, because if you dilute paint, it's going to dry faster than solid paint. And I can assure you they probably were diluted at least to some degree. But also he painted in a cooler climate, so it wouldn't have dried as fast as, say, here. So the point I'm getting out of all this is that, no, if you made a painting, it would not be a Pollock-style painting. Now, if you made a painting that was similar to that, if I made a painting, and I've made a few that were inspired by that, to the untrained person... Yeah, they might look the same. They might look identical. You could probably hold up Pollock's and then your own to someone who's never really studied them or, you know, never really seen his work in person. Yeah, you're, you're probably going to fool people and they would not know the difference if they hadn't studied the work. But are you making a Jackson Pollock painting? No. Finally, I want to talk about Pollock himself and just the way he approached these paintings. And I'll make this part short. I'll wrap it up soon. You see, Pollock, I don't think he intended to make these paintings when he first set out. Especially, again, if you go back and watch the movie, it's like he dripped paint on there and then he just started doing it and the rest is history. But he also had this internal thing where I think that he wasn't innately proud of the paintings. He made them because they were successful, but he dealt with kind of a creator's paradox, or at least I believe he did, where he was making these paintings and they were getting critically acclaimed and he was finding success with them. But I don't think he was happy with them, especially if you consider that his final work was, you know, kind of going back to, like after those were big, if you look at his final, final works, he kind of started veering back to the work he did before. Um, and I think that, he dealt with what a lot of people deal with. And I, I thought about doing a video on this. It's called the creator's paradox. And it's a theory that I have about creators and, you know, creating things that you like versus what's commercially viable. If you want to hear that video, let me know. Cause I'm, I'm, I do want to talk about it. But anyway, I think that he didn't intend to make these paintings. And I think that he made them because they were going somewhere and it was getting him, you know, attention and, and and sounds like they were selling a lot and stuff like that so so it was working for him but I don't think he wanted to now I think part of him created these paintings because he just stopped caring and if you look at a Pollock painting you could say well anyone could do that and you know it doesn't really take a lot of effort to make that but if you stop and look at the the vastness of these paintings it would take effort to make a painting like that because there's such innate layering and there's a lot of different choice in the, the colors and the different methods that he used and the different, uh, you know, the different objects he embedded in some of these paintings. I don't, I wouldn't say that they're the best works of art in the world. I'll, I'll be the first to say that, you know, there's a lot, Greater works, I think, that took more time. But as far as the paintings themselves, no. Nobody could match a Pollock-style painting. At least not exactly. Because Pollock, I think, was a little bit different. I mean, obviously, if you read his history, you know that he dealt with alcoholism. And ultimately, I think that led to his car accident and ultimately his death. But... That would play on how a person works and, and how they approach that work. You see, if you're not an alcoholic and you're not somewhat crazy, then you're probably not going to create the same type of works. I think that even if he intended to make the type of paintings that he did, these, these splatter or splash paintings, whatever you want to call them, I think even if he intended to make them, he probably didn't foresee how they would come out. It's possible that the line of works that he did were really just experiments in, in trying to create something different and people took to it because it was different. But saying that any person could make a Jackson Pollock painting, 
it's not correct. Or at least I don't believe it is. Because even I've made work that was similar, and I've seen other artists that make Pollock-inspired work. But there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more to the Pollock style or, you know, his pieces. You know, there's a lot to think about in the materials and the method in which he did that, but also kind of his mentality and his personality behind these paintings. You know, yeah, you could say that anyone could make a Jackson Pollock painting, but you could also say anyone can make anything that anyone's ever done. Anyone could make a Mona Lisa. Anyone could make any other famous painting that anyone else has done. I think that Jackson Pollock is an easy target because it's just lines, but if you've ever looked at his paintings up close, there's something about them that is just raw. There's a lot of energy and emotion and movement in these paintings that just really you don't see anywhere else. I think that the biggest reason he's noted for it is because he was the first person to do it, but also because people have tried to make that work and they, they just, they don't. You can't create something that's already been created by someone else because you're not that person. Yeah, you can make something similar, but you can make something similar to anything. So ultimately, that's kind of my closing argument is that, no, I don't think anyone could make a Jackson Pollock because they're not Jackson Pollock. And the materials have changed over time, and we don't know for sure the methods he used on every single painting, or even the materials for sure. We have ideas, and we know some of it, but we're not Jackson Pollock to know what he used on every single piece. So, no. No, we can't all make Jackson Pollock paintings. Yes, we could make work that is inspired by them, and that's how I got started painting. So, I owe something to Jackson Pollock because without him, I would never have started painting. Now, I have my own method, you know, the dabbed method, if you will, that kind of is my method that I've developed over time, and I, and I love it. But even in the paintings that I've made that are Pollock-inspired and the ones that I make for YouTube or for commissions, they're not Pollock. They're mine. And they might be inspired by him, but they'll never be pollock style paintings. So anyway, I, uh, I hope I didn't waste your time. I appreciate you watching this video. I know it's a little bit different, but it, it just it's just something I keep saying over and over again, and I wanted to kind of address it. So anyways, thank you for watching. I appreciate every person. I don't even know why people still watch these videos or subscribe to the channel, but <laughs> I'm still grateful. So anyway, I'll catch you guys in another video. Take care, guys. Bye.